There was a time when this was a common sight around Inlow. This was cotton country, and the fields turned white in August. It was time to break out the cotton sacks. There was nothing easy about cotton farming. The mechanical picker eliminated one back-breaking chore, but still, cotton farming was hard work, and the payback was never certain. Too much rain, too little rain, hill storms, bull weevils, and low market prices were ever-present worries. But the good seemed to outweigh the bad, and for a hundred years, cotton provided a means of livelihood for the families that called Inlow their home. Cotton is one of the world's truly unique plants. It's a member of the mallow family, along with hibiscus, hollyhock, and okra. As a cultivated plant, cotton can be traced back to the ancient civilizations of Egypt, India, and China. Today, it's grown in more than 70 countries around the world. It's an enormous industry, and it owes its success to a miraculous machine, the cotton gin. It seems improbable, but the cotton gin was invented by a native of Massachusetts. After graduating from Yale University, Eli Whitney went south to Georgia to serve as a private tutor. Plantation owners soon learned that Whitney possessed a talent for mechanical engineering, and they asked him to find a way to separate cotton seed from cotton lint. Whitney went to work on the project in his spare time, and he succeeded. In 1794, he received a patent for the Whitney Cotton Gin. His hand-operated contraption could produce 50 pounds of clean cotton daily. Although a tiny amount by today's standards, it was sufficient to revolutionize the cotton industry. Larger gins were soon developed as plantation operations. They were powered by a large, mule-driven drive wheel and bevel gear, which was located below the gin. The drive constantly beat on the sweep to keep the mule walking. The gin cotton was carried in baskets to a mule-powered press. Over the years, the process was improved, and cotton ginning became big business. By late in the 19th century, large gins dotted the landscape. A gin was located in almost every community of any size in cotton country. Although the cotton gin is a product of the 18th century, it is truly a 20th century mechanical marvel. Following World War II, the technology moved forward rapidly. Production capacity increased. Cleaning capabilities were remarkably improved. No longer was it necessary to pick the cotton from the burrs in the field. It could be pulled, burrs and all. Although Eli Whitney's basic design is reflected in the modern technology, Today's gin is a far cry from its modest little machine. This is a micro gin located at the U.S. Cotton Ginning Research Laboratory in Stoneville, Mississippi. It's designed especially to demonstrate how cotton is ginned. The process may vary somewhat, depending upon the brand and model of the gin, but the method is essentially the same. Cotton is propelled through the gin by a constant stream of air. The process begins at the gin suction. The seed cotton is unloaded and passes through the first stage of drying to reduce the lint moisture. It then moves into the first cylinder cleaner where it is dropped onto revolving cylinders. Wads are broken up and the cotton is fluffed as it moves across the top of the cylinders to the end where the flow reverses. Trash, primarily small leaf particles, falls out between the rods. The cotton is then discharged into the stick machine. It passes over the first cleaning saw, where the clean cotton goes directly to the next machine. Burrs and sticks, along with as much as a quarter of the cotton, are slung off over cleaning rods into the reclaimer section. The reclaimer saws and rods are similar to the main cleaning unit, but their adjustment is different to minimize the cotton discarded with the trash. The stick machine removes burrs and pieces of cotton plant. From the stick machine, the cotton passes through the second dryer where additional moisture is removed from the lint. From there, it moves into the second stage of seed cotton cleaning. 
from the seed cotton cleaner, the cotton moves to the conveyor distributor, which carries cotton to the extractor feeder over each gin stand. Here, the cotton is metered into a uniform flow across the width of the gin stand. The gin stand is the heart of the system. It performs the actual separation of the seed from the lint. Gin saws, which run between the ginning ribs, catch the fibers and pull them between the ribs, which are spaced too close for the seed to pass. The clean seeds slide down the face of the rib and fall out the bottom. They are then transported to the seed storage house. The fibers move the first lint cleaner. Inside the saw lint cleaner, the condenser separates lint from the conveying airstream and forms a uniform bat. The feed rods and feed plate apply the fibers to the lint cleaning saw. The fibers are carried under the grid bars between the sharp teeth of the spiral wound saw. The trash, being heavier than the fibers, is slung away from the saw by centrifugal force and discharged into a low velocity airstream. The lint moves to a second stage of cleaning identical to the first. When ginning and cleaning is finished, the cotton proceeds through the lint flue to the battery condenser. The fiber is removed from the airstream and formed into a bat. It then falls down the lint slide into the press charging box. The trapper packs the lint until the bell is finished. Then the press is rotated and a large hydraulic ram compresses the bell and holds it while strapping materials are applied. following the Civil War were not good years in the Old South. Reconstruction brought political turmoil and higher taxes. Yankee carpetbaggers and their hated Southern collaborators, the Scalawags, made matters worse. Proud Southerners felt not only defeated, but humiliated as well. For many, the time had come to get out, and young families began to look westward. A migration to the frontier state of Texas began. Riverboats brought most of them to the inland port at Jefferson, Texas. From there, they headed northwest in wagons for the rough ride to what would become Delta County. It was a rugged frontier that welcomed the new Texans. Living conditions were primitive, but they liked what they found here, and the population grew. So did cotton production. The 100-year reign of King Cotton in Delta County was underway. The history of Jenning and Enloe actually began about a mile or so to the northeast of town. This Delta County equipment barn sits near what was the bustling little 19th century community of Unicia. Today, the town is only a memory. When the Texas Midland Railroad elected to lay their tracks about a mile to the west, Unicia's fate was sealed. James Mitchell Jackson owned and operated a mule-powered gin north of Unicia. Later, his sons, Andrew and Bob, built a steam-powered gin in Unicia. That operation would soon be moved. A new town called Enlo had been laid out along the railroad, and Unicia's merchants and residents were moving there. Andrew Jackson was among the first. population grew, the little community of Unicia faded into history. Shortly after the turn of the century, the partnership of Andrew Jackson and J.H. Mullins built a gin in Enloe. Jackson later acquired the Mullins' interest and continued to operate the gin for a number of years. 
Eventually, he sold the gin to a group of investors in Enloe, and it became the Farmer Gin. Andrew Jackson re-entered the ginning business when the partnership of Jackson and Hull bought a gin that had been built in Enloe by Dad Coleman. They operated the gin until it burned in 1925. Andrew Jackson was an unrelenting entrepreneur with an eye to the future. He could see that the gins of the future would be powered by electricity, and he wanted to build one in Enlo. There was a problem. Electrical service had not come to Enlo. Not to be deterred, Jackson convinced Texas Power and Light to provide a line from Cooper to Enlo. He built the electric gin and operated it until 1935, when he sold it to the Farmers Cooperative. The cooperative continued to operate the Jackson Gin along with the Farmer's Gin until 1953. They sold it that year to Peck and Young of Commerce. Two years later, it burned. The cooperative bought the location and immediately built the gin that stands today. It commenced operation with a crop of 56. The old Farmer's Gin was dismantled. Almost lost in the history of Enlo is another gin, known by those who remember it as the Round Bell Gin. Gins of this type, which produced 250-pound cylindrical bells, were fairly common in Texas. The Enlo gin was owned by a British textile manufacturer. The cotton was shipped directly to their plant in Liverpool. The gin ceased operations in the early 30s. The cotton gins were the center of activity in the fall of the year. Cotton wagons poured in from all directions. The gins hummed along far into the night. Cotton yards filled with bales of cotton ready for shipment. At its peak, around 1930, the annual production of the Enlo gins reached 4,500 bales. Over the course of history, it's estimated that a quarter of a million bales of cotton were ginned and shipped from Enlo. Cotton was big business. The community prospered. Enloe's population grew to over 500, and there were 2,500 people living in the trade area. There was no radio, television, or motion pictures, so people had time to enjoy the company of their friends. Any kind of community activity was sure to draw a crowd. Business was good. The town had two drug stores, two dry goods stores, two grocery stores, and a restaurant. There was a funeral undertaker, a barber shop, a car dealer, an ice house, a lumber yard, and a cottonseed oil mill. There was an abundance of bodark trees around Enlo, and there was an unusual use for this tough yellow wood. A buyer in Enlo bought bodark and shipped it back east where it was used in the production of dye. There was a lot of business activity, and two Enlo banks were kept busy handling the money. But things began to change. The Great Depression ended. World War II produced an economic boom that was, for Enlo merchants, a mixed blessing. There was more money available for retail purchases, and that should have been good for business. Ultimately, it had the opposite effect. More and more people could afford to buy a car. Highways had been improved, and shopping at the larger stores in Cooper and Paris became an easy thing to do. The Enlo merchants no longer had a captive market, and their businesses began to decline. Post-secondary education also contributed to the demise of Enlo. The young veterans returning from World War II were able to get a college education on the GI Bill of Rights. Cotton farming was not a career path for these new college graduates, and they decided to seek their fortunes elsewhere. The modernization of farming methods also contributed to Enlo's economic problems. Farming was becoming less labor-intensive, Herbicides, improved farming equipment, and mechanical pickers eliminated the need for so many farm workers. Fewer workers meant less business for the local stores. Enlo faced a depressing situation. The children were gone. Most of the farm workers had moved away. The farmers who continued to till the land were growing too old to continue without the help of their children. It was time for them to quit, and they did. The era of the small family farm had come to an end. The reasons for Enloe's existence ended with it. By the close of the 50s, the demise of this proud little community was readily apparent. The school had been consolidated with Cooper, the county seat. 
the business section had almost ceased to exist. Many vacant buildings remained as mute testimony to its vanished glory. Farm cotton production declined steadily over the years. Fewer and fewer bales were being produced and gins began to shut down. Enloe's Farmers Cooperative Gin continued to operate long after most of its neighboring gins had closed. But although their served market expanded geographically, their production volume did not. Cotton farming was in serious decline. Eventually, the volume of business was insufficient to sustain a viable operation, and the end had come. In 1995, this proud vestige of Enloe's once booming cotton industry closed its doors. Although it has ceased operations, this important piece of Americana is still here to remind us of what used to be. Farmers Co-op Gin was organized in 1935, brought out Jackson and Mullins and the Farmers Gin. Later on, they consolidated into one gin, <coughs> built this gin new in 1956. It's the site of the J.A. Jackson Electric Gin. Would you like to come inside and look around? Up at the top there is the airline cleaner. It uh, takes some trash out of the cotton and breaks the lumps of cotton up more evenly. Go into the dropper, make it gin a little better. And on the shelf dryers, there's a big, big, bigger dryer there, 24 foot shelf dryer, and the other is about a uh, 16 or 18 shelf dryer. That's the top cleaner. Cotton goes through it. It comes out of your top dryer. Comes out of your 24 foot shelf dryer and goes through the top cleaner in the order that goes into the bowling machine. That's the saws in the bowling machine. It takes your burrs out of the cotton. There's a little bit of difference in a stick machine and a bowling machine. We never did have a stick machine. We just used a bowling machine. These stands are very dangerous if you're not real careful and know what you're doing. Lots of jenners lost an arm in these gin stands. Cotton would choke up in the ribs for these gin stands. Jenners usually wanted the stick made of soft, pliable wood to punch cotton out of the ribs because if you used a hard stick of wood, of some kind and never touched the saw, the saw would have this stick of wood, it wouldn't break and you couldn't turn loose of the, the stick in time to get your hand back out of the way. Where if you use a soft pliable stick, it would break before you get your hand in there. That's the ladder there that goes up to the Moss Gordon lint cleaner. Cotton goes around the bottom, goes around, comes out top, and comes down that lint slide, went into the press. This is a two box press. While the cotton is coming in on the other box, you put the bagging and ties on this bale, get it out of the way and shut the box and get it ready to rotate. Like this is a small dryer uh, burner. It furnishes hot air from a small dryer. Notice there's two different size burners and two different size dryers. Looking at the suction fan here, which is used to unload the cotton from the trailer or from the modules. 
the air is pulled through the dropper, pulled through the airline cleaner into the gin. Hardwick-Edder gin has turned out its last bell. The seed house is empty. The cotton wagons are parked. They won't be needed anymore. It's a quiet place, filled with memories of another time. It speaks to us of yesteryear, when small family farms dotted the landscape, and cotton was king. Thank you. 